If you will be opening your Bibles again to the New Testament, to the second epistle of Peter, and we want to continue with a look at 2 Peter 2, 1, 3, and 4. 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4. According as his divine power hath granted unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Notice through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the world the corruption that is in the world through lust. I would mention here the latter part of verse 4, the corruption that is in the world through lust. Lust is an inordinate desire to receive something or to satisfy it. Thus, corruption is in the world. Because it invites a violation of God's will to gratify the desire. It's an inordinate gratification of a natural desire. So that's how corruption is in the world. When we look all around about us, we see all that's going on in all the various countries and cultures and societies. And we see all the wickedness and things being done so contrary to the teaching of the Bible. And there's why it's there. People want things to satisfy certain desires. But they don't want to do it like God says. And thus corruptions in the world. Anytime you want to be a corrupt person, just violate the word of God. Any time that you want to do right from the heart, do what's right, as the Bible defines the right. But when you face the world, whether it's right now, this afternoon, tomorrow, then know that it's corrupt because of the lust of men. And know that when you preach the gospel of Christ, God's power to save them, that you're calling out of them out of that kind of disposition and action you're calling them to say that whatever desires i have they will be satisfied as the lord directs in his word thus the need for self-control that we discipline ourselves and that we bring every thought into subjection to jesus christ we spend our lives once having become a christian our old man of sins crucified we spend our lives bringing our whole character into alignment with the character set out in the New Testament of Jesus Christ because that's our desire. Nothing, nothing matters more to us than that. And if it ever gets to where one thing or several things matter to us more than that, then we'll be on the road to apostasy rather quickly. So it's a matter of training. Christianity is a taught thing. And it will only do good to those people who will be exercised by it, who will be taught by it. So we see Peter writing this to Christians. He didn't write this to people outside the church. I don't know how long some of these people have been Christians. But he certainly was uh, writing to those who knew the whole plan of salvation had from the heart obeyed the gospel. They assembled in worship on the first day of the week like we did. They live by the same truths we live by. Or we could say it the other way around. We live by the same truths originally given to them as it was in the New Testament. There's nothing new. And one of the great things are the exceeding great and precious promises. Because it's by these we become a partaker of the divine nature. So we studied this morning that concerning the nature of God's promises that some of them are not conditional, they're just going to happen. Because that's what God wants to happen. He said they will happen, and His promises are sure, so they happen. Some of them haven't happened yet. The Lord hasn't come yet. But He will. 
as surely as his promises to come the first time were kept, then the promise to come the second time will be kept. So we want to understand further the nature of God's promises. And as we teach the gospel to people, we've got to emphasize that to folks. Because in there are those promises that are conditional. God will only keep those promises when we fulfill our part in the matter. Now, I would like to talk to you this afternoon, based on First or Second Peter 1, 3, and 4, about what God has not promised. But a lot of people think he's made promises he hasn't made. And that's a great problem in people's living of what they think is the Christian life. Let me mention, first of all, that God has never promised that he, his son, Jesus Christ, will return to this earth again. When we say the Lord's coming the second time, we never say the Lord's coming to this earth again. He's not going to do so. He'll never set foot on this sin-cursed earth. And how is it corrupt? Because of the lust of men. And there are many who believe, though, that he will. Multitudes of people say, oh, I'm just looking forward to that time when the Lord comes back to earth. The Bible teaches in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 17 that we, the saved, if we're alive when he comes, will be, uh, meet him in the air. Never can you find a scripture saying he'll come to earth and we'll meet him here. In fact, what you find in 2 Peter 3 7 and 10 is that this world will be burned completely up, as we say. I've never understood the difference of something being burned up or burned down. But let's just say whatever there is about burning this earth, it'll be burned both ways to the point where there's nothing. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, the works therein shall be burned. So the Lord's never promised that he'll come set foot on this earth again. He hasn't promised that he will establish a kingdom when he comes the second time. Now, I recognize there are plenty of people who think they're fine, upstanding folks when it comes to God's attitude toward them who believe that when the Lord comes, then he's going to establish a literal earthly kingdom and he'll reign a thousand years literal thousand years that's just not the case the bible teaches that the lord's kingdom was established on the day of pentecost as we read of it in acts chapter 2 on that day people heard the gospel preached in its fullness for the first time on that day verse 37 the truth pricked people in their heart on that day they cried out men and brethren what shall we do on that day, Peter and the other apostles took them as believers in Christ, made believers because of the evidence preached in the first gospel sermons that were being preached at that time by the apostles and the one that is recorded. And they wanted to know what to do. We put to death the very Messiah we claim to be looking for. Men and brethren, what shall we do? And they were told as believers, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. Ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises unto you and to your children and all them that be afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That calling is done by the preaching of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to save folks, and it's to be preached to every creature, Mark 16.15. So the Lord was declared on that day, that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, as Luke by inspiration records, to be sitting and reigning then. He's already on his throne. He's been on his throne for almost 2,000 years. The kingdom exists today. So he's now reigning over his kingdom. There's not a kingdom to come that he will establish the Bible teaches that in connection with his coming, rather than establish a kingdom, he will set up, or rather he will deliver up the kingdom to the Father. Paul in that great chapter on resurrection 
1 Corinthians 15, where he's correcting errors in the church. At Corinth, concerning the resurrection, makes it clear that he'll deliver up the kingdom of the Father in verse 24. God has not promised that Christians will reign upon the earth in a literal kingdom after the Lord's coming. Present reign is the only reign there is of Christ. So there are those who believe that the righteous will reign upon the earth after the Lord's coming. But they believe that because of error. The Bible teaches the present reign is the only reign of the Christ. I think that would be a very interesting proposition for debate. The scriptures teach that the present reign is the only reign of the Christ. Now, if you were going to go about saying, no, that's not the case, how would you do it? The righteous are said to reign with him. So Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12. <clears throat> and it was said also the same in Revelation 1 and verse 6 and Revelation 5, 10. Therefore, the righteous reign during the present reign. The only reign we know about Christ is the one he took up on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ. And if you reign with Christ, you have to reign when he's reigning. And so we reign now. We're victors in Christ. So the righteous reign during the present reign. Romans 5, 17, Paul penned, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Can't get plainer than that. We reign with Christ. When is Christ reigning? Now, when did he start? Acts chapter 2. God has not promised to save everybody. He would like to see everyone saved. But because, as we learned this morning, some of his promises are conditional, there are some folks who don't want to believe they have any conditions at all to obey. They just won't. And so they're going to find themselves lost. I don't know what they'll say, if anything, when they stand before the Lord in judgment, when they knew all along what the Bible said. Yeah, but Lord, well, I won't get it. There are some who hold to the doctrine of unconditional salvation. I know that. And the idea is that somehow all will be saved. In fact, some who hold to the condition or the position of unconditional salvation will still try to say some will be lost. Well, it really doesn't make any sense to me. If you've got a salvation offered to mankind, knowing God would have all men be saved, and it's all unconditional, then why isn't everybody saved, whether they want to be or not? The Bible teaches that provisions have been made for all men, as clear as it can be. John 3, verse 16, I think, would be as good one as any. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. By the way, it didn't say there, will not perish. It said they shouldn't perish. Because there are other conditions to be met following belief. Hebrews 2, 9 says, But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. That destroys the idea that he only died for the elect who God foreknew to be saved. Nobody else is going to uh, have the benefits of the Lord's death. He died for everybody. God loved everybody. He still loves everybody. But men deny that salvation is conditional. They can't deny it by the Bible because the Bible makes it clear. A simple thing is Noah's ark. Noah could have built that ark and did. What if he hadn't got on it? What good would have been done him? So his faith, a living, active, obedient faith, complied with the will of the Lord. Conditions. Now God promised to save him. But if he hadn't done what God told him to do in the way God told him to do it, and for the reason God told him to do it, he'd drown like everybody else. 
God wants all men to be saved. Peter will say that, 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. Not willing that any should perish, but notice conditions, that all should come to repentance. If I can understand that all should come to repentance, then I can understand that all should comply with the rest of the conditions of salvation. Nobody can believe in Christ except to have a proper understanding of the word of Christ for faith comes by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Nobody can benefit from that faith if it's a faith that will not do what God said to do, which would be repentance and confession of faith in baptism for the right reason, the remission of sins, and then to live righteous life in the Lord's church, which is our ark of safety. Now think about that for a minute. What's the ark of safety today? Why well, the church. He purchased with his own blood, Acts 20, verse 28. Is the church worth the purchase price? Evidently it was, unless you want to call Christ a fool. And I'd hate to be guilty of that blasphemy. Christ thought the church was worth paying for with his own blood. Thus, every member of the church is added to it by the Lord. But what about every member? Well, when they're baptized scripturally, they've contacted the blood of Christ. And he's remitted their sins. They've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. He can add them to the rest of those washed in by the blood of the Lamb who met the conditions laid down. God kept his promises, and they were forgiven. Forgiveness takes place in the mind of God. When you from the heart obey the truth that God's revealed in his word, he's promised to save you. Will he go back on his promise? No. Everyone who's obeyed the gospel from the heart, understanding the truth, knew when they rose that water and gave a baptism in the mind of God, our sins and iniquities were remembered no more. It was over and done with. They'll never be brought back up again. And thus, we're able to be in that state of grace, in that covenant relationship, where we have the blood flowing for us as we strive to know and do the truth the rest of our lives. The Bible teaches that the Savior's invitation must be extended to all men. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Well, what if you won't take his yoke on you? You won't find rest. It's that simple. God has made a promise, but it's a conditional promise. God would have us all be saved, but he can't save us if we will not demonstrate our living faith and obedience to his will. So there are specific conditions that must be met. Now, God hasn't promised to save those who refuse to obey him. Now, some think that he will. Some think he's just not. Well, they really think he just doesn't mean what he says. That's what it is. They've been able to get around things like that in this life, and they think of God on their level. They think they can get around it with him. It won't work. The Bible teaches for when we have received grace and apostleship, Paul writing, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, Romans 1.5. Paul, why are you an ambassador of the court of heaven and an apostle of Christ? And any apostle could have said this. To teach that these pro this promise of salvation is conditional. To teach obedience of faith. Obedience to the faith. Among all nations. Why did he just say faith without obedience? For that's what the denominational world teaches. So saving faith is an obedient faith. James 2, 14, the verses following. And thus the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 5, 8, 9 says, Christ is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. I can't take that back. That's in the Bible. By the way, before you ever know who I was, it was in your Bible. And it meant the same thing when you read it without knowing who I am or any other member of the Church of Christ. It reads that way. It'll read that way on the Day of Judgment. It'll mean what it means. He's the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Vengeance will be taken on those, Paul said, who will not obey the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 1.8, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel. That's scary to me. God will keep his promises. If you don't obey the gospel, he's promised to deal with you this way. 
Will he keep his promises? He's kept every other one that there is. To save outside the church, God has never promised. There are multiplicity of people who think they're going to heaven or going to some place with God when they die and this world's over. And they don't believe you have to be in the church. The church has nothing to do with your salvation, they'll think. The Bible teaches plainly the saved are added to the church, Acts 2, 47. Now, the Lord was a, a dummy because if the church has nothing to do with salvation, why put us in it? What use is it? Why tell us the blood of Christ purchased the church? Why did he die for the church? If he could save us without the church, why the church? But I find Paul saying to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians 5, 23, that he's the Savior of the body and that that body is the church. Colossians 1, 18. Savior of the body, the body is the church. Elementary reasoning. If he saves the body and the body is the church, then you better be in the church. And by the way, that he puts the saved in the church, remember? Acts 2, 47. God has not promised to save by any means other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, there are folks who think there are various ways and means that one can be saved from sin and go to heaven. The Bible does not teach any such thing. And I may say again here, it's the only true, primary, infallible source book there is to Christianity. God has a definite plan for man's salvation. God has only one plan, or said another way, only one power for man's salvation or to save man from sin, Romans 1.16. It's the reason it must be preached to every creature. But because we're free moral agents, we can hear it and understand it and say, well, I don't believe it. All right. He's not going to force you against your will to believe what you even acknowledge to be the Word of God. God has not promised to save those who refuse to be baptized scripturally. He's not going to do it. You can tell yourself from now to however long you have left on earth that, well, I honestly love and care for Christ and I try to live by the Bible therefore if I have that mood that attitude that feeling then uh, I don't have to be baptized for the remission of sins any other reason to be baptized is not taught in the Bible you're not baptized because you were saved when you believed not according to the Bible in your mind you may have done so but if you did you went contrary to the teaching of the scriptures and many hold that baptism has nothing to do with salvation. That's not what the Bible teaches. Baptism is essential to salvation. Baptism puts one into Christ. Nothing else will put one into Christ. Now think about that for a minute. Paul said in Ephesians 1, 3, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3, 27 says that a faithful person is baptized into Christ. Now if you're not baptized into Christ, you're not in Christ. You do not enjoy all of the spiritual blessings of heavenly places. Sonship, forgiveness of sins, hope of heaven. You don't have any of that. Oh, but I do. You have a false hope. God's never promised any such thing as that to you. God has not promised then spiritual blessings outside of Christ. God has not promised to give us everything we want. I'm quite sure that when we come to the end of our way, having labored to study the Bible and live like the scriptures say as a member of the church, and if we can reflect after we're dead back over things that we prayed for on this earth, that we'll probably be so happy that God didn't grant us all of our petitions. That somebody knew a whole lot better about me and what I need to be righteous before him and to go to heaven than I do. Now the truth of God concerning how to become a Christian and live the Christian life set out in the Bible. But a lot of choices we make as to where we're going to go and what, where we're going to go and what we're going to do, all those things, we don't have somebody saying, yeah, take that job, that's the one to take. We don't have a voice from heaven coming out and saying, take that job. You have to use your own discretion, your own think so, your own examination. And that would have to do even if it, you change jobs. You got a good job here, but here's an opportunity. Or it looks like an opportunity from your standpoint. You pray about it. 
I always like the example that was given as to some people dependence on prayer when a fellow came to the door of a preacher's house. He said, I'd like to speak to your mama. He said, well, she's not available right now. He said, we're moving. I was thinking about it. He said, daddy says we may move. He's the preacher. I said, well, will your mother be ready for me to talk to in a little bit? Well, have her available. I'd like to show her something. So, well, Daddy says he's praying about moving, but Mama's upstairs packing. I knew what they was going to do, <laughs> and that's the way it is. You can pray all you want to, and you can say in those prayers, not my will, but thine be done, and you can weigh it every way you want to weigh it in everything in life. And there will be some, not all, some situations to where you just have to go ahead and make a choice. Sometimes you don't have the choice, but sometimes you have to make the choice. Well, you don't know whether that choice is, is the best choice or not. You may think it is. So as we pray to God about certain things, and we all have, we prayed it all like the Bible teaches, then it may be that we haven't received answer to those prayers because we didn't need to get everything we thought we wanted. Was good for us. Wasn't best for us. Didn't help us be closer to the Lord. We thought it might, but it didn't. I'm thankful for the overruling power of God's providence. Thus we say in every prayer, if the Lord will, or not my will, but God's be done. God's not obligated to give us everything we want. He hasn't promised to do so. Now, the Bible teaches that God knows our needs, and I'm thankful for that. He knows them better than I do. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Well, I do not know what all these things cover, but I know they have to cover the essentials of life. God is going to bless us according to our needs. That passage certainly teaches that, Matthew 6, 33. Well, I may think I really need certain things, and God says, no, you don't. If we as weak parents can tell children, you don't need that right now. Even though the child just knows they've got to have it. They can't get along without it. And parents say, no, you can't have it. Now, how much more does our Heavenly Father know how to deal with His children and what He gives us and what He permits for us to do? It just means trusting us. Well, how do you trust Him? You know you're doing what He said in the black and white Word of God. And you know you're willing to correct anything when you violate it. That's living the Christian life. Oh, by the way, in closing, God's not promised to exempt us from trials. In fact, Peter talks about this, and that's what we started this morning in 1 Peter. It's easy to fuss and to grumble and complain because of life's problems. I'm going to preach a whole lesson on this, and it'll be probably one uh, that's been preached on at least the topic <laughs> maybe millions of times, I don't know. But it's when Jesus came to Mary and Martha's house. Now, I know that Martha thought she was being what a good homemaker ought to be. Don't you know she had to have the house in pristine order? Don't you know that she had to have prepared and thought about the meal she was fixing? Don't you know all that was on her mind? You say, how do you know that? She's a woman. That's how I know that. And I know how God made a woman. It's natural to them. I'm glad it's that way. They have their feminine qualities. I'm sure God didn't make them like a man. Well, there she is, and something comes out about it. If I say this, I won't have to preach that sermon. Well, you remember the story. Martha comes and actually a little bit chides Jesus, would you have Mary come help me? That Greek word help there only appears one at the time in the scriptures. And the idea comes across that I'm trying to move this table. If I myself can't get it done, would you tell Mary to come in here where really she ought to be anyway as a woman in the kitchen and help me move this to get ready? The Lord's here. The Lord rebuked her. Have you ever noticed that? You're mindful of having to have every little thing done, everything, and you got opportunities here that nobody few people ever had Jesus is in your living room teaching and you're worried 
about a moving a table. Now you can make application to that in a lot of ways as we live the Christian life. Have you thought lately about not that many years ago to be able to be directly involved as we are in teaching the Hispanics, you'd have to prepare yourself to go to Mexico or someplace like that to teach it. Don't anymore, do you? You can have a hand in it either directly or indirectly. And that's what we're doing right now. Sometimes it helps to count the blessings of what's come our way and see what's more important than some other thing. And in understanding the promises of God, a lot of times things come our way when really we thought they should have come to our to, to satisfy us in another way, but this had to take place in our life before we really appreciated that. How much is a soul worth to you? How much is a soul worth to me? Do we appreciate the worth of a soul? I know we can all use work on that to appreciate even our own souls better than what we do. But sometimes we can have things just drop in our lap and not realize it. And people, are, I don't know why we're like we are. I don't, tell me why we fuss and grumble and complain. Tell me. <laughs> the Bible teaches the Christian will learn to rejoice in tribulation, Romans 5.2. Paul wrote, by whom also we have access by faith into his this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of glory. In Acts 5 and 41, and they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. God will take care of us. So we sing a song like that sometimes. God will take care of you. Now look what we've learned about these promises. God's going to keep some promises because they're unconditional and make a difference what we do or don't do. On the other hand, especially concerning salvation, going to heaven, there are those conditional promises. If we do not do what God has told us to do in his word, he will not do his part. So he wants to save us. Can he save all of us? No. It's not his fault. He's told us that if we love him, we'll keep his commandments. He's told us that a living, active faith, the obedient faith. He's told us, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Language can't be clearer. We can deceive ourselves. That's the only way it's going to work. But God is for us. You know where the problem is? We're too often against ourselves. We hurt ourselves. You ever watch children in a lesson of years? Younger children in particular. Then you get up about my age or older and you become older children and you still have to watch out lest you hurt yourself. But you ever watch? Now, be sure and watch those kids. Hold, if you're taking him out there by that pond, hold his hand. Well, doesn't the child have sense enough not to run the water? Children are children. Paul said, I had a child, I thought was a child, I understood as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. I have to deal with children as children. Well, God has to deal with us as children. Remember, we're his children. Some of us are older and more experienced in knowing and doing the truth and trusting in God's promises. Others of us are learning. We're all learning. Some of us are more mature in it. If that's not so, then you can't look at the qualifications of elders and not see that when you meet these qualifications, you're more mature in the faith than some others. Because he even says, a novice shouldn't be a poor elder. You're not ready. So God's not going to keep his promises on these conditional promises if we don't do ours. If the truth of God's word doesn't mean more than anything else. If we don't appreciate what we have dumped on our own front doorstep, maybe we should have thought it should have come another way. But here it is. What's the old saying, buddy? I've heard you say it many times. If you're giving lemons, make what? 
lemonade. Well, in a way, that's a very simple way of saying whatever is dumped out here before you as you go through life while you're trying to do God's will, make the best of it. Make the best of it. Don't always make it a bad thing. If you're not a child of God, what do you think about the promises of God? Well, if it weren't for the promises of God, where would we be? Where would we be? And when God loves us and says, now I want to see your love coming back to me from you. So if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. That seems rather reasonable. If you really have confidence in me that I'll keep my promises, that I'll take care of you, that I know better for you than you know for yourself, then obey what I told you to do, and I will take care of you. That seems simple. But the world rebels at it. And many of those that think they love God prove they don't. They just will not obey his will. If you need to obey the gospel, we've studied what to do to become a Christian. Not some hyphenated Christian. A Christian like Paul was a member of the Lord's church. As a child of God, when you sin, you know what to do. God's second law of pardon, repent, confess those sins, and pray God for forgiveness. There's God's way. Now notice in both cases, God's saying, I want to forgive you, and I stand ready to forgive you, but you're made a free moral agent, you have a will. Do you love me enough to do what I ask you to do. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, I invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.